Welcome to week one. Please remember that these video lectures are presented under the assumption that you've already read the chapter. In this case, chapter one, Process of Science. Make sure you've read that. The driving questions for this chapter have to do with the scientific method and hypothesis testing, um, factors that influence the strength of scientific studies, how you can evaluate the results of those studies, um, evaluating the evidence in media reports, and um, clinical trials that have to do with human health. We're going to focus mostly on this first question right here and this third one. Throughout this lecture, we'll talk about those two driving questions more than the other two, but we're going to apply what we've learned to a novel um, issue in human health that your book doesn't cover, but it is very important. First, we need to establish what science is. You've probably been taught since grade school from a very young age that science follows the scientific method, one single way of doing science. But this really isn't the way things are done most of the time. The idea of a singular scientific method can be traced all the way back to 1910 to a, a book called How We Think, published by a man named Dewey. And in his book, Dewey outlined some pieces to the scientific method. We know them today as this numbered step. Number one, make an observation. Number two, ask a question based on those observations. Number three, make a prediction. Number four, formulate a hypothesis. And then number five, finally test the hypothesis. Interestingly, originally in his book, Dewey had these as unordered bulleted steps. They weren't in any particular order. It was only after publication that these were reorganized as a numbered sequence of steps. And to this day, 100 years later, the scientific method is taught as the single way to do science with very few changes to that step. Some things were added, like peer review, but that's it. Your book is no exception to this. In reality, there are many different methods in science. There's a whole collection of methods based uh, on the particular field that you're in, and different fields have multiple methods as well. They happen in many different orders with many different steps. We'll talk about what those are. All processes of science do have something in common, though. I'm going to use the word processes of science rather than the scientific method because it's better. Some things in common is that the goal of science is to explain the whole uh, point is to come up with an explanation for something that's happening, some natural phenomenon. There's also the idea of evidence. Science relies very strongly on evidence. We draw these evidence-based conclusions. Our explanations are based on the evidence that we collect and gather. I also like to think of science as just one way of knowing. There are many different layers to the way that we understand the world around us in the universe. Science is just one of these. Some other ways of knowing, things like art, culture, traditions, history, religion. It's important to me that you understand science is different from, but not superior to, these other ways of knowing. So then, what does it mean to do science if it's not that prescribed method that you've learned about? This figure here that you see, it represents uh, a more realistic way of viewing science, and it's the simplistic version. Um, there are sub-steps within each of these, but this is better for presenting. What I want you to notice is that there's no starting point. There's no start here sign anywhere on here. There's no end point either. It's entirely possible to skip a major step entirely. You can go from community analysis and feedback and just kind of skip your testing and go to benefits and ideas. Um, I have an example for this later. You can just kind of return to basic steps. You can go to exploration and discovery, test some ideas for whatever reason, realize you're on the wrong track or just decide you need to go back and you can do some more discovery, just a kind of 
explore some things. You can cycle within all of these infinitely. You can spend entire careers circling and circling in one of these bubbles and still be doing science and being productive. Although it doesn't always feel that way. The traditional science that you've been taught about with this whole design hypothesis, test the hypothesis, all of that, it's just one of several types. What you've learned as traditional science is experimental science. This is science that um, manipulates variables in order to measure a response. These include laboratory trials, field experiments, tr clinical trials. Um, that's what's presented in your book. But there's all this other stuff. We have observational sciences. And in observational sciences, we don't manipulate variables. We don't have any sort of treatment that we assign to a group. Instead, we're observing patterns and events as they just naturally unfold and measuring whatever we can from those. Um, sometimes an opportunity arises where we can observe a natural event from start to finish. And we can measure responses from that. This is called a natural experiment. For example, in astronomy, you can't manipulate a star and induce it to explode in a supernova. Um, but there's a lot of sky. If you have the funding, you can look around for other stars in various stages of death through supernova, and then you can measure responses from that, such as light emissions or speed of gas dispersion or whatever. Historical sciences are also very similar to observational sciences in that you don't manipulate anything, uh, but historical sciences study things that have happened in the past and can never be replicated. You can observe even natural experiments with these, not from start to finish at least. Where was I? Oh, paleontology is a really wonderful example of a historical science. We can't experiment on dinosaurs and observe them in action. We can't even really go back and observe some natural event happening. What we can do is look at fossils and the observations therein and see how these animals died and using their structures, try to figure out how they lived. Um, we can't see them in action, though, so we can't manipulate them either. We're relying entirely on observations made from fossils and rocks. And then this new one, with the rise of computational power, um, there's this whole new field in science called informatics, which is developed. Informatics deals with just enormous amounts of data. Bioinformatics is one that might be familiar to you. Um, this, an example of bioinformatics was the Human Genome Project back in the 90s. It took almost a decade, but what they did was they sequenced the entire genome of, the, of a human, all of the base pairs in their DNA. It takes less time now, but back in the 90s, it took them like 13 years. Now, that's a lot of data, and there wasn't any experiment involved. They were just trying to see what was there. They weren't answering the question. They weren't manipulating anything. They were just recording what the DNA of a human being is like. You can do this. This is doing science. Um, there's no experiment, not even a question all the time. And especially at the beginning of a study in this exploration phase in informatics, you can spend an entire decade and billions of dollars just exploring the human genome. Um, there's no testing there at all. You can take some feedback from the community say, hey, I want to spend, you know, however many billions of dollars in 13 years doing this. They say yes. And then now what we have found is that we have enormous benefits, a wealth of knowledge about the human genome. They found genes associated with breast cancer from this project and many others, a lot of benefits to society and some positive outcomes. And from there, new studies have been developed which test ideas. All of it, each every individual step of that was doing science. However, most scientific disciplines do involve some form of hypothesis testing. So your book defines a hypothesis as a testable and falsifiable explanation 
for an observation or question. That's pretty decent, um, but if you ever get the chance, and I would strongly encourage you to do so, to study um, the philosophy of science, you'll find problems with this, specifically with falsificationism. But for this class, we'll go ahead and use it, and I want to add something. I want to add the predictive nature of a hypothesis. I want you to think of a hypothesis as a prediction. If such and such happens, then some response can be measured, uh, as well as an explanation. It's both of these pieces. This response will be measured because of such and such a theory. Anytime you're asked in this course to construct a hypothesis, you will be expected to have both pieces, a prediction and an explanation. Think of it with a sentence structure, if, then, because. It's helpful that way. And it's also incredibly important that you understand that a hypothesis is never proven, never ever. You cannot do it. It's impossible. You can't, first of all, reproduce infinite replicate trials. You can't test something in every single conceivable situation. Um, you can't control all the variables. There are variables that we don't even know about. We can't control for them if we don't know about them. We can't identify even all of the confounding variables. Now, those are weak arguments. More importantly, there are pieces of evidence which can support an incorrect explanation or an incorrect theory, which we'll talk about. I want you to consider there is a recent claim uh, from a flat earth believer this person took a level on a plane um, and put it in the aisle of the plane, flew so, you know, for some long distance, I can't remember where they were, uh, and they made the observation that the level remained with that bubble in the centerpiece. The airplane didn't tilt except for takeoff and landing, but they flew around what we would know as the curvature of the Earth, and the level didn't change, so they considered this observation as support for the flat earth idea, hypothesis. I'm not going to call it a theory, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. If you're ignoring all the other evidence that there is out there, yeah, that piece of evidence does support a flat earth. However, the flat earther did not prove that the earth is flat because he's ignoring everything else. There is an alternative explanation which fits that evidence in addition to all the other evidence that we have, and that is that the Earth is round, and since it's massive, it has a gravitational pull on the level, so no matter where he was, let me draw a picture, around the globe, that's, that's a hemisphere, airplane takes off from, I don't know, Shanghai, flies around to, let's say, LA, beautiful drawing, right? The force of gravity is always pulling toward the center of the massive object, in this case the Earth. So no matter where he was, as long as the plane was in flight and not taking off or landing, the level would show that the plane was level, even though the nose of the plane is following the curvature of the Earth. That evidence did not prove that the Earth is flat. By itself, it also doesn't prove that the Earth is round. You have to take into account all these other pieces of evidence and variables that this particular flat earther was ignoring. Instead of saying proven, and you'll hear scientists, I'll show you videos and things where they say proof or proven. Um, I don't like that. I wish they would stop doing that, but they do it because it's accessible to the public. But now that you guys are educated, you'll be able to spot that and know it for what it is. We don't say that a hypothesis is proven. We can say that it's supported or accepted until further observations or evidence show otherwise, or if it isn't supported, it's rejected. Those are the words I want you to use, rejected or supported or accepted. Both of those mean the same thing. Okay then, so if a hypothesis is a test, a falsifiable test based on an explanation, how is it different from a theory? And how is a theory different from a law? I'll tell you a secret, just like I said you'll see scientists using the word proof when they shouldn't be. Um, most scientists and practitioners, they use 
theory and law and hypothesis mostly interchangeably. Um, it doesn't make a difference in their job. I, I would be willing to bet that only a few of them could actually confidently explain the difference as well. But there are differences and I want you to know them. The explanation part of a hypothesis is tested to become a scientific theory or to help clarify um, a piece of a theory. The word theory is thrown around a lot in everyday language and just casual conversation. It can mean like a hunch or an idea, um, but that's very different from a scientific theory. A scientific theory, it's a causal explanation, a causal explanation. There is a mechanism that causes something to happen. This something that is happening is the law, which we'll get to next. This explains how or why a law is occurring. It's the very mechanism, the mathematics of it. That is totally different than a hunch because this is an extremely strong explanation. It's supported by extensive evidence. We don't just throw theories around. For example, the theory of evolution. It is an extremely strong explanation for how species change over time. It's very well supported. If you ever utter the phrase, evolution is just a theory, you'd better be using the word just sarcastically. Now, a scientific law, that's what happens. It's the observable pattern, um, and it exists because it must exist. There are some words here on your screen that I'm going to go through and explain exactly what they mean. A law being a pattern which is necessarily true, this means that it's impossible to observe an exception to this pattern. Um, an example, which is a little abstract, but stick with it. We've never observed a solid gold sphere with a diameter of one kilometer. We just haven't. However, it's not impossible. It could exist somewhere in the universe. There's no law that states that it cannot happen. However, we have also never observed a sphere in one kilometer diameter of uranium. Uranium, in case you didn't know, is a very unstable, highly radioactive element which decays. The nuclei in the atoms fall apart um, over time. So a sphere of uranium cannot be that large. It is necessarily true that you cannot have something that large. It would explode long before it became a kilometer in, so in diameter. Therefore, that uh, observation of not seeing a sphere of gold one kilometer in diameter is just kind of situational. Uh, it's coincidence, not necessity, that we haven't observed that. Now, the same example is also universally true. A one kilometer diameter sphere of uranium cannot exist on Earth, nor in space, or even in a black hole. In a black hole, you have no volume because it's a singularity. Therefore, it is spatially universal. Anywhere in space, it cannot happen. It's also temporally universal. It can exist now, it cannot exist in the future, and it cannot have existed in the past either. So this law, it's a pattern of observations which is true because it has to be true. It must be true. Now, Depending on who you're talking to, a researcher or a philosopher or a layman, this may or may not matter. Most scientists don't care at all which you use. Um, and if you, you do use these rather strict definitions, in biology, we do not have any laws. All of our patterns that we observe are dependent upon life as we know it. Carbon-based organic life with a self-replicated molecule of heredity known as DNA, which has errors and that's how we evolve. If, for example, there was some life form that made no errors because whatever method of heredity it had was not this self-replicating molecule from the errors, then all of a sudden there's no evolution and so that is not a law, it is a theory. Okay, now that's a lot of information and frankly 
you probably don't care, even though I find it fascinating. What matters much more to your life and your success in this class is that you understand the way that evidence works. Evidence is essential. I cannot stress that enough. There are different strengths of evidence. The weakest form is anecdotal evidence. These are just observations. For example, if you notice that we've had a particularly snowy, cold winter, that's not strong evidence against climate change. It just isn't. As you move down this list here, that's not a good color to use. As you move down this list, your evidence gets a lot stronger. Okay, anecdotal evidence is the weakest. Now, if you have a controlled laboratory study, such as uh, animal or cell studies, you've got a control group and so forth, that's stronger than anecdotal evidence. Case studies are a bit stronger. Uh, they do have a flaw, though, in that they're not generalizable. They're very case-specific, but you can strengthen that by doing cohort studies or multi-case studies. Those are a bit stronger still. Randomized clinical trials, such as the caffeine um, study in your book, these are very common, and most researchers would consider a randomized clinical trial to be kind of the gold standard for studies especially with uh, human health and pharmaceuticals. But the absolute strongest evidence comes from systematic review of peer-reviewed research. This can also be known as meta-analysis or meta-reviews. Uh, these studies are so powerful because they're examining data and conclusions from many different studies. They can be enormous. Uh, they can search for overarching patterns and trends, which helps eliminate any um, confounding variables that may have been present in one study, but not in the majority of them. Uh, I'll give you an example. You might have heard the statistic that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is a human-caused phenomenon. Our climate is warming because we're dumping pollutants into the atmosphere. This number comes from a systematic review over the past 30 or so years of climate research. And what it means is that 97% of the studies done in that time found support for human-caused climate change. All right, if we can increase the strength of evidence, how do we do that? There are a couple of ways. Right away, use a control group. There you go. Now you're going away from anecdotal and into um, a trial, into studies. You can perform several replicates so that you can uh, measure the response of your dependent variables with uh, a little bit of numbers and then run some statistics. Now you're relying on data, not observations. More specifically, some factors that you can do are increasing that sample size. Uh, a very good number to strive for is 30. 30 samples in each group, in your control group, in whatever treatment groups you have. Uh, that's kind of a good rule for a solid sample size. You can also randomize uh, group assignments. So in your textbook with the caffeine example, the study, you can randomly assign participants to the control group who are drinking decaf and the treatment group who are drinking regular caffeinated um, coffee by, I don't know, flipping a coin or whatever. Random number generator. You can assign groups randomly. That helps strengthen your evidence. You can also, and this is standard, when you're publishing your research, you do a very brief review of the literature that has been done already, what you're doing is examining the theory that you're operating under, that explanation that's part of your hypothesis. You have to know what the sum of human knowledge can already tell you about that. So you review some of the literature. Now you can take this a step further by doing a full systematic review and get the strongest evidence possible. And for those, you don't even have to gather your own evidence because you're looking at previously published studies that have already been peer-reviewed and subjected to criticism from the scientific community and often from the public too, which will come into play in a little bit. Okay, even later, uh, when you guys do your unit assessments, I'll talk more about this, but there is a difference between data or data, you can use them interchangeably, data and evidence. They're not quite the same thing. I'll keep reminding you of this, um, but let's talk about it right now for a minute. 
I want you to think of data as the measurements or the observations that are made. That's all it is, data. Evidence is that data plus the interpretation of that data, what it means. That kind of leads us into another little conversation about how you can uh, increase the strength of your evidence. The interpretation part of the evidence, uh, that interpretation for it to be strong must come from experts in the field. This plays into credibility. Someone who's a credible expert is someone who, uh, and this can be measured a couple different ways, but usually someone who's published a lot of papers, which have then been cited in further research. That's how you gain credibility and you get more money for grants to do more studies and you get tenure and things like that. Now, uh, this credible expert is someone who's very well trusted. We trust the interpretation of, for example, climate data uh, from climate scientists, credible experts, over the interpretation of, say, a politician or a businessman, because the scientist, that climate scientist, is better equipped to understand what the data means. They have a more com complete knowledge of the science, and so their interpretation is more likely to be accurate. Okay, now let's put this information to use. Uh, there was a very important preliminary study published in 1998 out of a very well-renowned journal called The Lancet. This is a very trusted journal. Uh, this study um, claimed to have found a link between the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and developmental disorder in children. This is also known as autism. Uh, immediately there was a lot of public outcry and opposition toward vaccines. This has led to uh, an increased number of outbreaks in very easily preventable diseases in children. I want you to withhold judgment for now. Uh, read through this paper. It's posted in Canvas under the welcome module. Uh, look for Wakefield et al. 1998 in week one. Read through it. Uh, do the best that you can. It is a scientific paper. It's what we call primary literature. It was written for other medical professionals to read. Uh, so there will be a lot of words and jargon that you probably don't understand that I don't understand necessarily either. Uh, so feel free to Google terms that you think uh, you need to know to understand, but I think you can get the gist from reading around them and using context clues. But if you are having particular difficulty, please email me and I'll help walk you through it. You do need to pay particular attention to a couple of things like sample size, um, the sample selection, or in this case, the participant selection. Wakefield was, um, that's the author, he was studying children, so he should have gone through some, some very special precautions in order to not violate ethics laws. Those might be a little bit hidden, so try to find them. It's not a long paper. It was, like I said, preliminary. It was kind of exploratory just to see if there is anything there. Uh, so it's not very long. I want us to discuss this. This will be discussion one, and I do want it to be heated. I know you have opinions on this. Um, some of you probably have children and have had made the decision to vaccinate your children or not. Um, Heated discussions are definitely by far the most interesting, but please remember that we're going to be dis, um, we're going to dare to disagree. We're going to be very respectful of each other, be respectful of others' ideas and opinions. Absolutely disagree with someone, but make sure that you're wording your responses carefully so that it's clear that you have issue with their argument or their ideas, and not with them as a person. We're not um, making these attacks personal at all. This will be, again, the case for all discussions. We only critique ideas, but never people. Or critique the heck out of each other's ideas. That's where the fun lies. All right, sum up what we've talked about so far. Science is a process. Uh, it's got a variety of methods, not just one. But we do use this variety of methods. Sometimes we even switch what we're doing in the middle of an investigation. Uh, but by and large, we do systematically study in order to explain natural phenomenon. 
There are several concepts within that, such as theory and evidence that I've talked at length about. I want you to be able to describe those and use them correctly for the sake of this class. Um, we also talked about hypotheses. These are prediction plus explanation. They're tested through experiment or observation, including things like natural experiments. They can either be supported or rejected, but never, ever proven. Now, after this, go ahead and take the lecture one quiz. Uh, take a look at that Wakefield article and uh, do discussion one. Remember that you need to post your original thoughts and ideas by Wednesday night. And then uh, as soon as there are some responses, you can reply to at least one other students by Sunday night. At Sunday at midnight, the discussion will be closed. And there will also be a rubric posted. Look through that rubric so that you know what's expected of you and how I'm going to grade you. Okay, have a wonderful week.